morning. Thanks very much for joining us today for the ASC's 2023 Corporate Finance Energy Matters Disclosure Information Session. I'm Denise Weirs. I'm the Director of Corporate Finance here at the Alberta Securities Commission. Um, and uh, uh, this morning's session is the second part of our uh, disclosure review information sessions this month. Uh, this today's event, as you know, will focus on the results uh, of the disclosure reviews conducted by our energy team here at the Alberta Securities Commission. So the reserves and uh, resources disclosure, uh, some findings uh, from our sustainability reviews, and some capital market statistics. We hope that this session will be uh, useful to you. Uh, we're always looking at uh, additional sessions and information sessions that would be of assistance uh, to those in the Alberta capital market. We do hope to host another uh, National Instrument 51-101 introductory session uh, sometime this year. But if there's other areas of interest uh, to you, please do let us know. Uh, we'll be taking questions during today's session. If you do have questions, please enter them in the Q&A section um, at the bottom of your screen, uh, not the chat function. I think the chat will be disabled. So um, in the Q&A and uh, uh, staff will be monitoring those and answering those as we go. The slides from today's uh, session will be available uh, right away on our website. You can find them if you search on our website for events and presentations, um, and then the uh, recording will also be available uh, probably in, in about a week, uh, I understand. So that's um, about all I have to say uh, for this morning. I hope you enjoy the session. Uh, I'm going to turn it over now to Craig Burns, the manager of our uh, energy group. Thanks very much. Thanks, Denise. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, welcome to the webinar. Uh, very pleased to be here. Uh, I will be presenting today um, alongside Ramsey Ewan, our um, senior evaluation engineer in, in the energy group. Um, and just to uh, let you know, uh, just behind the scenes, we've got uh, the rest of the team helping out with Q&A, as well as uh, in the event of uh, any necessary troubleshooting, etc. So we've got uh, everybody's involved in this here today. Um, and Denise just mentioned that our, our, we're anticipating to um, host another um, uh, beginner's uh, introduction to uh, 51101 uh, fundamentals um, uh, webinar here this year, uh, hoping to do something actually within the next couple of months. So stay tuned for a uh, notice about that, um, hopefully uh, within uh, a few weeks. So um, before, uh, without any delay here, let's uh, let's get rolling here. So. I'm just going to run through our agenda here for today. So I'm going to, um, there'll be a brief introduction here, uh, take us a, a couple of minutes, so maybe about five minutes. And um, then we're going to move into regulatory framework where we're going to go through uh, the framework that we use for technical energy disclosure. So we'll go through the, the typical 51-101 and some of the other um, bits of information that we, uh, uh, that um, um, are uh, used. Uh, we're um, then going to go into reviews. We're going to talk about the review process that we do, the purpose, the types, the outcomes as background. Then we're going to discuss some specific concerns um, regarding uh, disclosure from uh, reporting issuers engaged in oil and gas activities. Those subjects today will be um, Form 51-101 uh, F3, so the Report of Management and Directors on Oil and Gas Disclosure. We're going to talk about qualified reserves evaluators and qualified reserves auditors. And we're going to talk about navigating uh, 51-101 and COGI handbook conflicts. I don't mean uh, conflicts in, in, in the sense of um, any, uh, uh, anything tremendously um, violent, but more of a, when you come across uh, wording in one that seems to conflict with the other. And that's a subject that's been uh, we've been asked many, many times over the years to to explain that a little bit better about how to proceed in those situations. So we're going to talk about that here today. Uh, then we're going to talk about disclosure um, expectations involving some other energy subject matter. That will be uh, helium. We're going to talk about renewable hydrocarbons. And then energy-related environmental, environmental sustainability disclosure. So we're basically going to talk about, uh, I think everybody's probably um, seeing a lot of this information out there. People are talking a lot about um, you know, companies achieving uh, status of being carbon neutral. They're 
Um, it, we're hearing a lot of terminology around clean tech and 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 um, reducing emissions, et cetera. We're going to talk about some of that language that's out there and and uh, just some expectations around it. Then what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to pause for for questions. Um, Actually, I should say we're going to pause for questions after the, the oil and gas um, disclosure concerns are, are raised as well. So we'll just sort of do a brief pauses, um, just to, because as we get to the end of this, it's probably going to be difficult for um, questions to seem attached to the subject matter as, as we get in deeper and deeper. So, uh, and then um, I'm going to turn things over to Ramsey, who's going to talk about environmental sustainability disclosure. And um, following that, I'll come back to discuss energy in the Alberta capital market. We're going to do a final Q and A. Um, so, please, as as Denise had already mentioned, uh, please uh, submit your uh, your questions through the uh, Q and A function. Um, and anything that we don't address in the session, we will do our utmost to get back to you um, following this event. There will, if you've got comments or, or questions that are very specific to your situation, we will um, likely try to address those. Um, outside of this event, we'll try to address things that are of most broad interest um, in in the event today. Uh, thank you. So, without any further ado, here introduction. Uh, I think most of you are familiar here that uh, we're the Alberta Securities Commission, and uh, we administer Alberta securities laws, entrusted to foster a fair and efficient capital market and protect investors, and we are a member of the Canadian Securities Administrators, the CSA. Now, the ASC is the CSA's lead oil and gas regulator. And that's what uh, the other jurisdictions look to us for. Next slide, please. So um, within the energy group, we're actually within corporate finance at the ASC, and we apply our expertise to energy related matters. We've taken this all things energy approach now for a few years. We, we continue with our ongoing commitment to oil and gas, uh, but we do try to keep our eyes open to uh, anything that, that, that has to do with energy that affects Alberta's capital market. Our focus uh, includes uh, just this is just a sampling. Um, so for oil and gas, we look at, of course, the exploration production companies. So that would be the NI 51101 filers. Look at midstream, which includes pipelines, services, uh, helium, hydrogen, uh, you know, carbon capture utilization and storage, environmental sustainability, uh, in particular, greenhouse gas emissions, renewable energy, renewable hydrocarbons, um, environmental liabilities. Those are sort of the, the key things that we look at. So uh, to achieve our goals um, as a regulator, um, the things that we do in the, in, in, within the energy group, we conduct reviews. So we look at disclosure, we look at technical evaluations, and we assess compliance with securities legislation. We develop and maintain securities legislation and technical guidance, and we communicate with Alberta capital market participants. So this includes, uh, of course, today's webinar, and also the um, uh, oil and gas, sorry, the uh, energy matters, report that we published in, in January that I'm hoping everybody sees from which most of the content that we're going to uh, discuss today is from. So next we're going to go into regulatory framework. So for we'll talk about oil and gas and then we'll talk a little bit uh, in, in more about more general things. So with respect to oil and gas, we've got National Instrument 51101 standards of disclosure for oil and gas activities. That's our key instrument. And we're going to be talking about uh, that um, or things related to that over a significant amount of t today's um, session. So this applies to reporting issuers engaged in oil and gas activities. You'll see that um, there's lots of footnotes here. So throughout the, the slides, uh, the footnotes will, will, will reference area where you can actually find additional information, including definitions and uh, specific wording on requirements and that. Um, so just hoping that uh, if, if you want additional information, if you want to understand more more detail about what something like oil and gas activities means, uh, you can follow up by uh, following the uh, footnotes. Thank you. Um, so uh, 51101 addresses general standards and specific annual requirements. And of course, the technical standard is Canadian Oil and Gas Evaluation Handbook. There are related forms for filing on CDAR. There's, there's five. Uh, the three of utmost importance for us today uh, include the F1, which is the Statement of Reserves Data, and other oil and gas information. So this is where a reporting issuer puts its annual oil and gas disclosure. There's the F2, which is the Report on Reserves Data, Contingent Resource Data, and, uh, and uh, Prospective Resources Data by Independent Qualified Reserves Evaluator. So uh, execution of this uh, form, it filing of it on CDAR firms, Kogi Handbook compliance. Uh, 
then lastly, we have the F3, which is the report of management and directors and oil and gas disclosure. The execution of filing of this affirms content and filing of the F1 and the F3 and the filing of the F2. Additional oil and gas um, uh, framework, uh, regulatory framework materials that you should uh, be aware of include the companion policy to 51101. And there's various CSA staff notices and also a couple of ASC staff notices. The one of most importance today would be the uh, would be a 51324, which is a revised glossary to 51101. And of course, as I already mentioned, the Kogi handbook, which is maintained by the Society of Petroleum Evaluation Engineers, Calgary chapter. And via their website, you can obtain copies of the Kogi handbook. So other materials um, that would apply to not just oil and gas, but all energy would include uh, the Securities Act, obviously, of Alberta, the Energy Matters Report, which I just previously mentioned, which you can find on our website. Also, the Corporate Finance Disclosure Report, which was also published in December. You find that on our website. And then there's these uh, financial reporting bulletins for, uh, that are published from the ASC's Office of the Chief Accountant. So um, these things have been out for a number of years, and uh, we still refer people to them. The content is still, for the most part, relevant um, and, and up to date. Um, and so you'll find information there, for instance, on um, uh, abandonment reclamation, um, you know, the, uh, abandonment liabilities, et cetera. So that's one of the um, more important ones that we point people towards. So next, we're going to talk about our reviews. So first off here, um, let's just chat briefly about the purpose of these reviews. So we assess if disclosure is misleading, including by omission. We, the, uh, we also check to see if the disclosure uh, that we're looking at focuses on material information and otherwise complies with all disclosure requirements. So um, the energy group efforts are focused on energy and disclosure requirements specific to that, just to, 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 to make that clear. So in terms of process, uh, these reviews incorporate disclosure and specific report material, a uh, support material, I should say. And, and by that, I mean something like the technical evaluations. That's mostly what our support material, um, um, mostly what we consider when, when we're talking about support material. And these reviews prioritize reporting issuers for which uh, the ASC is the principal regulator or PR. Um, but we also assess disclosure where other jurisdictions are the PR. So we proactively assist on oil and gas matters regardless of whether it's a 51101 filer or a service company or pipeline, et cetera, we'll, we'll um, reach out to the, to the um, appropriate jurisdiction and, and uh, uh, provide our, our views. And uh, in terms of other energy related matters, we're also quite active there. Um, we assist as requested, but we're also very active in looking at the disclosure just to try to get an understanding of how things compare between jurisdictions. And if we see something that's wildly um, out of line, we'll, we'll uh, attempt to raise it and see if uh, we can um, um, get it rectified. So in terms of review types, um, the key thing that we do here uh, is it, at the beginning of every year um, is, is the screening reviews for oil and gas. Uh, so those look at the annual um, filings, the F1, the F2, and the F3. And uh, that really sets the stage for, for an awful lot of the work that we do through the year. It helps us identify where issuers are going wrong, um, sort of comparatively speaking, it allows us to identify issues that we should raise in our reports, in our webinars, et cetera. Um, we also do screening reviews of press releases, and that will help us uh, evaluate whether we need to punt something up to a, a more formal review. And we do these um, environmental sustainability technical um, screening reviews, and that's what Ramsey is going to be talking about here today. So those assess baseline information concerning GHG emissions and other environmental matters. Next slide, please. Then uh, in terms of actual reviews, we do press release reviews, continuous disclosure reviews, prospectus reviews, um, and uh, technical reviews. For, we'll actually call in the technical evaluations, and that's not just for oil and gas. That could be for any energy-related energy uh, matters. So the outcomes of these reviews, they range anywhere from no action to referral to the ASC's enforcement division. Most of our reviews will fall somewhere between advisory comments um, and a requirement to correct and refile. And it's, uh, there's, there's, there's a few now and again that we'll find their way further down this, uh, down this list, but we're happy to say that most things can be dealt with uh, much more, uh, you know, uh, without that much or without going into to, to those, um, those levels. So we're going to talk about 
uh, reviews now specific to oil and gas filers. So we'll focus on the 51101 disclosure. So the issuers that are engaged in oil and gas activities, as opposed to say services in midstream. So um, overall, our disclosure remains pretty good. Uh, few reporting issuers we found have consistently problematic disclosure. Most issues are addressed via awareness, as I just mentioned. Now, for, with respect to areas of concern, most of these involve smaller reporting issuers. These are often um, surprisingly um, long established, often with experienced management and directors. Uh, we've noticed this over the last few years. I don't know if this is an issue of, of, of experience or, or, or resources available um, to, to um, um, address uh, disclosure, uh, but we have noticed that. Um, but it's really, I would say the Alberta, small Alberta uh, reporting issuers, uh, are pretty good situation overall, um, but we do have more concerns with jurisdictions outside of Alberta. So those principally regulated in other jurisdictions. Uh, so, so for the small oil and gas companies tend to be more troublesome uh, disclosure. The reviews are more complex uh, and, and more, um, you know, more issues to try to unwind and address. Um, but also newer reporting issuers, so the, the, the newer, smaller reporting issuers, which I'm happy to say we still do have some of those, um, they, they do tend to have uh, more challenges in terms of disclosure and, and getting those things addressed. Um, next slide, please. So today, what we're going to do is we're going to go through uh, and address concerns involving the F3, um, qualified reserves evaluators, qualified reserves auditors, and of course, as I mentioned before, navigating these, these so-called conflicts between 51101 and the Kogi Handbook. So with uh, uh, the um, uh, Form 51101 F3, the concern overall, uh, if I could summarize this, would be non-compliant reports due to filing issues, errors, and material modifications. So, um, of course, the F3 has to be filed annually, as we've already talked about, and that's a requirement under um, Section 2.1 of the of the um, instrument itself. And um, specifically, what we what we'll notice, we'll see when there are issues, we'll notice that we will see reports filed when they're not required to be. We'll also see reports that aren't filed when they when they're required to be, so they're absent. When uh, when we're reviewing these, we'll see a number of different issues. These will involve such things as um, required signatures are absent, or the signatories aren't actually qualified to sign those sign the forms. We'll see missing dates or incorrect dates. Uh, we'll see an incorrect alternative. Of course, there's two alternatives um, uh, that that are to be used: alternative A and alternative B. And we'll talk about that momentarily here. So we'll see the wrong alternative used. Also see that the report is uh, materially modified, which isn't permitted, and we'll talk about that um, uh, next here. So first we'll just quickly just go through the key requirements. So it's the, the key requirement for the F3 on the annual basis is to file a report in accordance with the F3 no later than when audited financial statements must be filed. So only identify a report as an F3 if it's for annual filing requirements. We don't want to see an F3 um, if it has nothing to do with, with annual filing requirements. If you've updated a reserves evaluation and you're, you're issuing some, um, some disclosure around that and, and uh, you're issuing or filing an F3, that's a, that's a no-no. Um, it can cause a lot of confusion. People recognize that these forms are for annual filing purposes, so we really don't want to see these things filed for any other reason. The report uh, must be executed by two officers, one of whom is a chief executive officer, and any two directors other than the ones that I just mentioned here in the last bullet. Now, if there's only three directors and two of them are, are referred to above, all must execute the report. So, the, so we do see signature issues. Um, usually these are easily rectified, um, but just a little bit of attention to detail on that would be appreciated. So we were talking a moment ago about the alternatives. So there's there are two alternatives to be used and are to be considered uh, and, and the alternative A, of course, is if you have reserves data, contingent resources data or prospective resources data to report. So when there's at least one of these that are that are um, disclosed in your F1, you would use alternative A. If you have none of these, so no reserves, no contingent resources and no prospective resources to report, you would use alternative B. So use that when there's none of these. 
Now, the, the report that we're talking about must in all material respects be in the required form. So we say don't modify, don't remove representations or add other representations. We'll, we'll often see uh, issuers running into issues around those representations where they will think that something maybe um, it doesn't, it doesn't apply to them. They'll change it to something that, that does more apply to them. Um, that's, you have to be very, very careful those representations. Uh, the requirement is to, is to keep that report in, in all material respects um, intact. Uh, so please no, don't make changes, don't modify it. Um, sometimes it's modified in such a way it's very difficult to notice the changes. And then when you go through it and, and carefully, you'll, you'll find those things and those issues can, uh, um, uh, can create filing issues for, uh, for companies. So we want to try to avoid that if at all possible. Um, and I, I would say if you, do, if you do materially modify it, then the question becomes, is it actually the F3 anymore? So you may actually have not uh, complied with your filing requirements if, if, you, if, if the changes are material. Next thing we're going to talk about are qualified reserves evaluators and qualified reserves auditors. So the key concern um, on, with respect to this is that disclosure is not prepared or audited by a QRE or QRA as required. I'd also add to this as a concern that there seems to be a lot of uh, misunderstanding or, or uh, assumptions around what a QRE or a QRA is and what the requirements are. There's a lot of people that think that they um, can call themselves QREs and QRAs, QREs more specifically, um, that with a careful read of the requirements, um, I think that you know, we, would, we would raise some concerns about that. Um, so specifically, situations where disclosure isn't prepared or audited by at least one QRA, QRE or QRA as required, isn't prepared by those qualified to perform QRA, QRE duties. Also should mention here, um, qualif uh, qualification to prepare disclosure under another jurisdiction's instrument, say under SEC, doesn't automatically qualify you to perform those same or similar duties under 51101. So we're looking for people that have um, experience qualifications uh, with 51101 and the Kogi Handbook uh, if you're performing the duties, um, the, 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 that, that is something that um, um, we're very careful to, uh, to, to, to ensure. Next slide, please. So as for key requirements, so reserves or other information of a type specified in the F1 must be prepared or audited in accordance with the Kogi Handbook. Anticipated results from resources other than reserves, so whether we're talking about contingent resources, prospective resources, et cetera, um, or, or an associated value must be prepared by a QRE or a QRA. So those are the two main um, times where we're gonna invoke here uh, these QRE and QRA requirements. Now, with respect to reporting issuers, they have responsibilities here. Uh, it's not just the QREs and QRAs the, or people who wanna call themselves that ensuring they are, they're qualified, but also reporting issuers have gotta make sure that they're qualified. And uh, they have responsibilities to appoint one or more independent QREs and QRAs and direct each to report to the board of directors on the reserves data, contingent resources data, and prospective resources data in the F1. If those are disclosed in the F1, um, there's an expectation that there'll be a requirement that they'll report to the board of directors on that disclosure. And the reporting issuer's got to ensure as well that they have the independent QRE or QRA execute the F2. Next slide, please. So what exactly is a QRE? Well, a QRE is, in respect of particular reserves data, resources, or related information, they possess professional qualifications and experience appropriate for the estimation, evaluation, and review of the reserves data, resources, and related information, and is a member in good standing of a professional organization. So you're going to notice here that we've got um, italicized words and also a couple of that are that are emphasized so the, um, with an underline. So the italicized terms are all defined in uh, 51101 or in the glossary uh, staff notice 51324. Um, and it's very, very important to, to know that these words are being used with respect to the instrument itself. When we use these words, evaluation and, and, and review and resources and et cetera, um, it's very, very specific to 51101. So um, if you're doing an evaluation in another jurisdiction, what you call an evaluation, it's not necessarily gonna be an evaluation under 51101. It's not necessarily gonna mean the same thing. So uh, for a QRE, they've got to have at least five years of practical petroleum experience, including three recent years of evaluation experience. 
And, um, you know, what, one of the things that we were always stressing that the, is that the evaluation experience has got to occupy the majority of the practical experience. Um, and there's not a lot of people that will dabble in reserves that would ever um, really fall into, to, uh, would ever be able to really qual uh, consider themselves to be a qualified reserves evaluator. You've really got to be ensconced in reserves and doing it consistently. Um, so just doing a year end here or participating in a year end evaluation now and again is not um, going to be satisfactory. Um, and uh, you've really got to specialize in reserves evaluation if you're going to consider yourselves a qualified reserves evaluator. Next slide, please. So what is a qualified reserves auditor? So they're an individual who, in respect of particular reserves data, resources, or related information, possesses professional qualifications and experience appropriate for the estimation, evaluation, review, and audit of the reserves data, resources, and related information. And of course, is a member in good standing of a professional organization. So similar to what we just uh, went through for qualified reserves evaluator, um, but you'll notice the, the, the word audit has been put in here, of course, and uh, that has a very specific meaning. So they've got to have at least 10 years of practical petroleum experience, including five recent years of evaluation experience. Evaluation experience is going to occupy the majority of the practical experience. Um, very, very few are going to uh, be able to consider themselves qualified reserves auditors. We've got far more qualified reserves evaluators out there, even though there's not that many of them, um, comparatively speaking. But uh, to be able to consider yourself a qualified reserves auditor, you're really a specialist within a group of specialists. So I uh, just want to really uh, emphasize that. Next slide, please. So we mentioned uh, earlier a couple of words that um, I said were defined within 51-101 and they were very important. And one of those words was evaluation. So the term evaluation is specific to 51-101. And this is the uh, definition. It's the process whereby an economic analysis is made of a property to arrive at an estimate of a range of net present values of the estimated future net revenue resulting from the production of the reserves or resources other than reserves associated with the property. So whether it's reserves or whether it's rotor involving volumes and values, but it's very specific. These terms, of course, we have to find terms within this definition that link you back to 51101 as well. So it's very important that you understand um, if you're saying you're a qualified reserves evaluator, you're qualified to do evaluations. This is what we're assuming that you were uh, qualified to do. And uh, with respect to an audit, it's the process whereby an independent qualified reserves auditor carries out procedures designed to allow the independent qualified reserves auditor to provide reasonable assurance in the form of an opinion that the reporting issuer's reserves data have in all material respects been determined and presented in accordance with the Kogia handbook. So again, we've got defined terms in here. If you'd like to um, understand more about what these terms are referring to, we'll point you towards um, uh, the um, uh, 51101, the glossary, uh, also uh, the staff notice 51324. Next slide, please. With respect to professional organizations, this is another uh, term that we've used in the definitions for QRE and QRA. Um, a professional organization is a self regulating organization of engineers, geologists, or other professionals whose professional practice includes reserves evaluations or audits and who meet certain criteria. So examples of this include the Association of uh, Professional Engineers and Geoscientists of Alberta, so PEGA, and also the Society of Petroleum Evaluation Engineers, SPE. There are other um, groups that would be considered professional organizations. Those are discussed within the um, companion policy to 51-101, and I would direct you there if you'd like to learn more about that. Next slide, thank you. Um, so in summary, a QRE or QRA is a specialist who meets the following requirements. They have professional qualifications and experience in the estimation, evaluation, and review of reserves data, resources, and related information. This experience, um, qualifications, et cetera, must relate to 51101 in the Kogi Handbook. They have to be a member in good standing of a professional organization, but also 
course, I have to stress that reporting issuers must ensure that those they appoint as QREs and QRAs are qualified. So reporting issuers are ultimately responsible for the disclosure. They've got to ensure that, that anybody who's representing themselves as a QRE or a QRA is, in fact, uh, one of those. And um, uh, that, uh, uh, that, that is just something that's, that, that companies have got to pay close attention to. Uh, we have had some situations where um, that hasn't been the case, and uh, it can be a very expensive um, issue to fix. You've got to, um, uh, potentially, if you've done some work internally and the person who's done the work is not qualified to do it, they think they are, and then they realize they're not. When we conduct a review, they've, in some instances, had to go back, um, engage with a independent qualified reserves evaluator. Um, so independence, I should mention, is, is, is a different issue altogether, but um, it, it, you can do your work uh, under certain circumstances internally, but you still have to be qualified. Um, and so what ends up happening is if, they, if the person that's doing it in, internally isn't qualified, oftentimes it will have to go external. That can result, obviously, in a lot of additional costs for a company and, and, and a lot of cleanup and disclosure to do. So just hoping that we can get people to um, be very cognizant of the requirements around this and uh, pay very careful attention to it. So um, just one last thing I would just stress there, that, that, that joint responsibility between the reporting issuer and those that they appoint uh, to ensure that um, they're qualified. So um, the last oil and gas subject we're going to talk about here, uh, navigating 51101 and Kogi handbook um, conflicts. So disclosure errors and deficiencies due to conflicts. So what will often happen is somebody will um, look at 51101 and it's, uh, it directs disclosure preparation or audit in a certain manner and uh, they go to the Kogi handbook to see uh, so to learn a little bit more, and maybe the Kogi handbook says something that they interpret as being different. Um, Want to stress uh, that the Canadian securities requirements must be met, and we'll talk about that, about how to, how to achieve that. Also, the situation where you go to the Kogi handbook, and there's uh, specific disclosure expectations that are uh, mentioned. Um, there's not a lot of those, but but that, that does happen. Sometimes Kogi will um, go into um, areas of disclosure, or at least make mention, and... Um, those will sometimes conflict with Canadian securities requirements. Um, so I, I would just um, you know stress around the Kogi handbook that if it if it's mentioned if it's talking about disclosure more generally that's one thing. In some cases, it does mention Canadian securities um, requirements and Canadian securities disclosure disclosure public disclosure in Canada and those sorts of things. And sometimes that will if you go back to fifty one one hundred one will create some challenges with. Uh, issuers trying to figure out what are they supposed to rely on. So we'll, we'll talk about that um, here in some detail. Next slide, please. So the key requirement um, for, for reporting issuers here is to interpret the Kogi handbook consistent with Canadian securities requirements, including principles, requirements, and restrictions. So 51101 directs disclosure for reporting issuers engaged in oil and gas activities. At the same time, the Kogi handbook does say that evaluations must be fit for purpose and meet regulatory requirements where the work is being done. So those are two very important things um, to keep in mind. You have to also keep in mind that, that, that the Kogi handbook isn't exclusively for disclosure in Canada. Um, it, it is a more, does have um, uh, users beyond Canada. So just want to keep that in mind that uh, I think people should um, be aware of that when they're, when they're looking at it and uh, with some of the wording in there just to, to ensure that uh, they are meeting uh, Canadian disclosure requirements when they're using the Kogi handbook. And if it appears that there's a conflict um, to, um, we'll see here about the reliance on, on Canadian securities requirements. So, so going back to what 51101 um, says and uh, is, is, uh, is, is extremely important. Um, so we're going to talk about uh, some examples here where there can be conflict or at least some challenges in interpretation between 51101 and the Kogi handbook. Um, so we've been asked many times actually in the last couple of years to, to talk specifically about where some of these conflicts lie. Um, so one of these, of course, lies with the abandonment reclamation costs, or ARC, and uh, we've talked about this extensively in the past, and you can refer back to some of our previous uh, um, oil and gas um, disclosure reports or energy matters reports, where we've talked about this in more detail about the, about the um, specific requirements for disclosure under 51101 on this subject, um, but just wanted to let you know that that is an area where um, there are some are some discrepancies you want you to pay very careful attention to. 
So the Kogi Handbook directs the accounting of some restoration costs, decommissioning liabilities as abandonment reclamation costs that aren't recognized as abandonment reclamation costs under 51101. This can result in erroneous disclosure of abandonment reclamation costs and also future net revenue. Um, and uh, that erroneous disclosure, of course, and has the potential to be materially misleading if, if, if care is, um, or if, uh, these, if these errors are of a certain magnitude. So, so please, uh, care is uh, um, really warranted here when, um, when you're trying to uh, understand what to do. I would just really emphasize the importance of following what 51101 is saying on this subject. And uh, when you're looking at Kogi, to sort of look through, look through the 51101 lens. Um, just keeping in mind here that when, you know, when we talk about abandonment reclamation costs, that is a term that is defined in 51101. It has a very specific meaning that's um, specific to 51101, and it's not a term that's, um, uh, that I that, uh, would not advise you to use any other definition of that term when we talk about it in 51101, use the, 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 the definition of that term per 51101. So the next area here, now this one isn't an area where we actually have disclosure issues. I think there's maybe a couple um, over the years, but it's not, it's not really an issue. Just wanted to point out that within the reserves reconciliation, so there's a requirement to do an annual reserves reconciliation, of course, within the F1 under item 4.1. And um, there are specified reserve change categories that have to be used. And there are a couple of reserve uh, there are a couple of change categories, as they're called in Kogi, that um, aren't recognized under 51101. So that's another area. And we don't have any issues there where people look at Kogi and they look at 51101 and they understand they're not supposed to use those um, change categories that don't have, aren't mirrored in 51101 as a reserve change category. So that seems simple. Interestingly, under ARC, it's a bit, bit different where people then will, will take the wording in the Kogi handbook. Um, off or sometimes over what's said in, the, in 51101 and say that they have to because Kogi says that. So I just would, you know, I think just emphasize the, the need for some consistency. I think um, if, if you don't think that, if you're aware that you shouldn't use certain categories for the reconciliation, but with um, uh, abandonment reclamation costs, you're, you're suddenly relying on what Kogi says and, and not what 51101 says. Um, that can raise some 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 concerns, and, and we try to catch that with reviews and ask questions, understand um, what's been happening. Uh, next slide, please. And the last one here, and I think this may be the most important one um, for for people because it's 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 one that gets gets forgotten, um, and that involves terminology. So, uh, what we what we really want to emphasize here is that um, fifty one one hundred one, of course, has has definitions in it. And um, National Instrument 14-101 has definitions, and also the Security Statute. So the Securities Act has some specified um, uh, terms that are defined. So when you're looking at, at, at these um, different documents, for terms that are used in them, but they're not actually defined in them, the requirement is to actually refer to the definition or interpretation if there is one in the Kogi Handbook. So if we have a, if we have a definition in in uh, 51101 or 14101 or the security statute or an explanation for a term you to use that if there isn't one there rely on what the kogi handbook says if conflict or inconsistency arises um, the definitions in 51101 14101 etc apply so i think that that's um, something that um, is important to emphasize because uh, when we do end up with conflicts, uh, oftentimes, if once we point out to people that, you know, in terms of the terminology, abandonment reclamation is a good example of that. Um, you know, the, the default needs to be the definition if it exists in, in 51-101 or the, the other in uh, fourteen one hundred one, et cetera, um, and, and, to, and a reliance on that over the reliance on the Kogi handbook. But there are terms that aren't defined in in um, uh, the statute or these instruments, and, and there is has to be a reliance on the Kogi handbook. And in those cases, you have to rely on those definitions in the Kogi handbook. So um, now we're gonna just pause here for questions and see if we've got anything that's uh, relevant to the subjects we've just been talking about here. Um, So here is one, uh, well, will these slides be shared? Okay, uh, yes, they will be. Those the slides are going to be 
uh, posted on the website here subsequent to this uh, event. Which engagement would the ASC consider to have more assurance, an evaluation or an audit of reserves data? Uh, well, clearly uh, an audit would have more assurance overall um, because the person who's done the original evaluation that's audited has got to be qualified and there's, going to, there's a whole bunch of different criteria that have to be met for that. And then the work is uh, subsequently um, audited by somebody who's got to meet a whole other set of qualifications and, and there's checks and balances in place. Uh, to ensure that um, the work is done appropriately. So um, hopefully that answers that. Is the... ah, If a company uses more than one evaluator, are they required to file an F2 for each evaluator or can they be consolidated into one F2? So that's an interesting one. So the wording, um, if you look at section 2.1 of the instrument, the wording actually specifies to file a F2 or a report in, in, in accordance uh, with the F2. Um, we have seen separate F2s. It is, I, I can't, can't say it's been, it's been a significant issue in any case. Um, a lot of companies will consolidate them into one and um, that I think is the preferred uh, choice uh, because the disclosure um, in the F2 concerning uh, volumes and values, uh, you really wanna have that um, all in one spot if possible. You don't wanna have people having to go um, assuming that there could be another F2. I think if it's at all possible to uh, consolidate into one F2, um, but there have been some situations where that hasn't been the case. Um, you know, in, in certain circumstances, I think it could be a, a problematic, but I, I don't think it's a, it's a major issue. Um, so that, maybe we'll just move on here to, we'll talk about other energy related subjects. I'll just grab a drink of water here. So for this section here, we're gonna talk about expectations as opposed to um, talk about concerns. And the reason for that is we don't see, um, you know, the disclosure for these subjects is actually relatively new for the most part. And I think it's better for us to talk about what we're hoping to see because there's not, um, you know, we don't have uh, an instrument like 51101 that directs disclosure, say of renewable hydrocarbons or sustainability. And um, because of that, I think there's a lot of questions around how should the disclosure uh, be done? What should it look like? And, and so I think talking about expectations is probably more important here than, than, than talking about um, uh, kind of the concerns that, that, that we see. But I think you can read, you'll be able to read into what we're talking about for the expectations where there may be some concerns. So we're gonna address expectations involving helium, renewable hydrocarbons and environmental sustainability. So, First off, helium. So helium is an interesting one out, out, of, out of these three um, because of its relationship with oil and gas. So we'll talk about that. Um, but there's really, there's growing interest in helium. Uh, this is something that's been um, really uh, coming to the forefront over the last few years. And um, its association with hydrocarbons is, is really important to us. Uh, it's not always the case. There's not always an association, um, but there often is. And, uh, but the key thing to keep in mind is that, that helium is often found with a variety of substances, or it is. I guess I, I'm not aware of any um, pure play helium where there's nothing, absolutely nothing else in that reservoir. It, it'll, it, it, it tends to be found with things like carbon dioxide, nitrogen, water, um, methane. And um, so there is a process uh, that has to be gone through um, subsequent to recovery to um, separate, uh, purify uh, before the helium is sold. Um, and uh, when you find uh, helium in conjunction with hydrocarbons, the hydrocarbons uh, will need to be separated out from the helium as well. And those uh, hydrocarbons will be used in, in operations. They'll be re-injected, they'll be sold. So there, there, there is a relationship and that's uh, gonna form uh, uh, the basis of uh, a good part of this discussion. Next slide, please. So these two substances not only are found um, and it's no surprise, of course, that they're going to be found together um, if you understand the, um, uh, the requirements for, for, for um, uh, migration and trapping in that for hydrocarbons. Um, if you're trapping hydrocarbons and there's any uh, helium in the area, there's a very high likelihood you're also going to be trapping the helium in there. And uh, so finding, developing, transporting helium and hydrocarbon, very similar. Of course, there's differences in, in, in processing in that, but a lot of the basics um, are very similar. And we see 
these um, substances being developed um, often in the same areas, overlapping um, reservoirs, etc. So due to their association, reporting issuers that are engaged in oil and gas activities may become involved with helium. It, it, it can be inadvertent or could be purposeful. Um, now, pursuing helium um, can often uh, result in, in, in an issue of becoming engaged in oil and gas activities by virtue of the fact that they may encounter hydrocarbons. So um, inadvertently or otherwise. So um, this is really where the complications start. Next slide, please. So just going to talk about some key points here first. So reporting issuers engaged in oil and gas activities that produce helium from a property as a byproduct must provide helium disclosure for 51-101. So under those specific circumstances, there's an expectation or a requirement that we're going to see helium disclosure per 51-101. So we'll talk about this. Um, what are byproducts? Byproducts are recovered via producing a product type. So as a consequence of producing a product type, if you produce helium, um, you will be uh, subject to 51-101. Reporting issuers otherwise involved with helium aren't going to be engaged in oil and gas activities. So they're not going to be subject to 51-101. However, we strongly encourage the adaptation of the principles and requirements of 51-101 for disclosing material helium information. Now, this gets really tricky, um, but there's a very good reason for it. 51-101, uh, if you uh, follow the disclosure requirements, you are going to um, pretty much be assured that you're going to be providing all the information that, that um, stakeholders are going to need, at least all material information, uh, will be covered under 51-101. So it can provide a very good guideline for disclosing something like helium to ensure that you provide the right information. Um, also, I would just distress here that uh, the utilization of the Kogi Handbook. Um, so for disclosure that's required under 51-101, you're going to use the Kogi Handbook, and we strongly encourage it to be used in these other situations where 51-101 doesn't apply, but the Kogi Handbook has got um, information specific to preparation of helium, um, evaluations and audits, and um, it there is nothing uh, similar to it available. It is. It should be the go-to um, source for you. So the expectation is that you're going to be using the Kogi Handbook for dis uh, for um, helping you prepare um, your information for ultimate disclosure. Um, so I would just just say here that that in order to be subject to 51-101, helium must be associated with the oil and gas activities. So byproduct of recovery of the product types. Helium is not a, a product type, so you'll never see um, helium uh, covered a, a, as a product type disclosed under 51-101. There's no requirement for that, so not volumes and values, but it is recovered as a, as a byproduct um, or can be recovered as a byproduct, and there are byproduct disclosure requirements per 51-101 that helium will be caught under. So, so I just stress those are for limited um, aspects. Um, next slide, please. So for helium disclosure, we want you to, we want to ensure that um, you do it in accordance with all applicable requirements. Material information is disclosed in regulatory filings. Key risks and assumptions are provided. Technical terminology is defined and explained. This is very important. Um, in, in particular, when talking about helium, because there's there's going to be terminology that's that's not necessarily going to be uh, familiar to, to um, a lot of people that are that are reviewing that disclosure. If they're more familiar with um, oil and gas. Uh, may not understand some of the terminology used for helium. Want you to to explain any terminology that's novel. Um, we have some scenarios here. We have three scenarios that we're going to go through to address disclosure preparation for helium. These will hopefully um, address any of the uh, concerns coming out of um, uh, today's discussion. So next slide, please. So um, number one, for a reporting issue, we're engaged in oil and gas activities with helium that's a byproduct. So that was what we were just talking about here uh, a moment ago. If, if you're producing helium as a byproduct, 51-101 applies uh, to specific aspects of 51-101 that relate to byproduct disclosure. So you must prepare or audit such disclosure using the Kogi Handbook, um, same as all other oil and gas um, uh, disclosure. 
Then you would disclose other helium information, including resources. So whether it's reserves, if you have helium reserves, or you have helium contingent resources, perspective resources, etc. Um, you would disclose this elsewhere. So it's not going to fall under 51101. You wouldn't put it under 51101 because that could be misleading, could cause confusion. So you're going to want to do it elsewhere. But we've got um, something here for convenience sake that may be helpful. Uh, we would uh, recommend that you consider a clearly demarcated, labeled, and described section within the 51101 disclosure, but separate and distinct. So if you wanted to, excuse me, if your helium um, byproduct disclosures in 51101, and then you've got additional helium information that relates to reserves and um, and uh, contingent resources, etc., that has been prepared in accordance with the Kogi Handbook, you want to have that, you want to disclose that, you're well within your rights to do that. Um, it may belong, especially if it's related to those by, if, if it's a byproduct of, healing, of, of, of uh, oil and gas activities, it may very well be beneficial to have that within a section within your 51101, but not technically within the 51101 disclosure. So put a border around it, label it, explain cl very clearly what this is, that this is not oil and gas activities, um, but this is relevant to those activities. That's why it's here. So in those cases, uh, for disclosure that falls outside of 51101 technically, use the principles and requirements adapted for helium. So as I said, use the um, use 51101 and uh, as 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 a guide to the types of information that you will want to consider disclosing for helium. So you can use a similar format if it's clear that it's not 51101 related. So we don't want to see sections um, with oil and gas terminology and, and oil and gas um, subtitles that you would normally see for 51101 disclosure used. Tr don't try to con or try to avoid confusing people. Pardon me. Um, that's really the key here. Um, and uh, use the Kogi handbook for that disclosure. And, you know, I, I think for that to do that clearly demarcated section and you're saying it makes sense and, and I think you know, keeping it proximal um, is is probably preferable um, and um, highlighting, uh, you know, making very, very clear that it's not part of your 51101, but this is why we've included it. Um, and uh, just as a as a maybe just for emphasis here of saying about resources. Of, for helium, so reserves and, 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 and contingent perspective resources, there is no way to disclose those under 51101, and the reason is is that um, helium is not a product type, and only product type can have reserves um, and, and um, other recoverable volumes and attributed values disclosed under 51101. Next slide, please. So our next um, scenario here is a reporting issue or engaged in oil and gas activities but the helium is not a byproduct of those oil and gas activities. So this could be a company that actually does have oil and gas operations, but it has a property where it's recovering helium that is completely unrelated to um, oil and gas. So the helium is not coming as a byproduct of those oil and gas activities. So what do you do? So 51101 doesn't apply. Um, so don't disclose it under 51101. Uh, and in this case, you wouldn't include that information proximal to your 51101 disclosure, you wouldn't want to cause confusion. So you wouldn't do a, you know, a separate section within 51101 and clearly demarcate it. You wouldn't do that in this case because it's completely unrelated. Uh, so disclose it elsewhere, including the resources information. So if you've got reserves or contingent or prospective resources, disclose that elsewhere. Uh, but to, for that disclosure, the principles and requirements um, from 51101 adapted for helium we would, we would highly encourage you to use that. You can use a similar format to 51101, but don't make it look like 51101 disclosure. Um, and uh, use the Kogi Handbook to prepare it. Next slide, please. So for this uh, particular scenario, a reporting issuer that is not engaged in oil and gas activities, but it has helium. So the helium clearly doesn't have anything to do with oil and gas activities. What do you do? Well, you actually do exactly what we just said for the, in, the, in the last situation. Um, 51101 doesn't apply to the helium disclosure. Don't disclose it under 51101. Disclose it elsewhere, but all of it elsewhere. Um, use the Kogi Handbook. You can use a similar format um, to 51101, relying on the principles and that to ensure that the information that, that a stakeholder is likely going to want to see um, is disclosed. So um, I think 51101 offers a very good um, time-tested um, framework for providing that information. 
Next slide, please. Next, we're going to talk about renewable hydrocarbons. So these are synonymous with green hydrocarbons, biofuels. You'll see those terms used a lot. Um, maybe maybe you'll argue with me on, on whether some of these things are technically uh, renewable hydrocarbons or not. There's, there's, there's lots of discussion out there on these subjects. But very broadly, um, anything that, that seems to fall into uh, you know, you're manufacturing a hydrocarbon, um, we're going to consider that to be, uh, in a, as long as it's from renewable sources, um, we're going to consider that to be renewable hydrocarbon for this discussion. So there's a lot of this disclosure that we're seeing out there now, a lot of companies are getting into this, and this is really driven by sustainability efforts. And um, renewable hydrocarbons that we're talking about are manufactured from biological materials. They use various um, biological chemical um, uh, etc. processes. So um, the source material, I mean, vegetable and animal oils, um, crops, crop re residues, um, trees, waste, forestry waste products, animal manure, things like this. Next slide, please. So examples of the substances that are produced uh, from uh, these processes that we would consider renewable hydrocarbons. So that would include things like diesel, um, ethanol, um, there's methane, um, all of these, um, most of the time when you'll see these disclosed, if it's methane, people will actually call it renewable methane, so that's helpful. Uh, but the important thing here is that these substances are chemically, chemically equivalent to um, refined products from hydrocarbons. The only difference here really is that um, these are not um, technically considered to be um, uh, product types, and, and they would obviously not be caught under 51101. We're going to talk a little bit about that, um, but they are chemically chemically equivalent. So, um, and they are refined products, and refined products, of course, aren't um, caught under 51101. Next slide, please. So, 51101 doesn't apply. So, these substances or the manufacturing of these substances is not associated with oil and gas activities. So that if you want to look at the, the, that defin the definition for that term, um, the manufacturing of renewable hydrocarbons is not considered to be an oil and gas activity. So therefore, the, the products that are produced wouldn't be um, uh, considered product types nor byproducts, and uh, they're not caught by 51-101. So the expectation is that you're not going to disclose recover, uh, renewable hydrocarbons under 51101. This isn't an issue. I um, haven't seen anybody do it, but uh, I can imagine at some point in the future you'll have a company that's that's involved with renewable hydrocarbons as well as uh, engaged in oil and gas activities, and this could uh, present um, a conundrum for them where they're trying to figure out how do they get their disclosure out. Um, next slide, please. So for renewable hydrocarbon disclosure, want to ensure that it's in accordance with all applicable requirements. Material information is disclosed in regulatory filings, key risks and assumptions are disclosed, and technical terminology is defined and explained. I would say that this is even probably more critical uh, for this subject because it is a, a new, new-ish subject that, that we're seeing more and more of, and there's a lot of terminology discussed, uh, whether it's you know, technologies being used, um, uh, different products that are being manufactured and it's very hard for I would assume for a typical reader to really understand what um, is being spoken about it's hard for for people experienced in the area as well I think uh, in some cases ex you know, experience in energy and reading these uh, reading the disclosure documents and really getting a good understanding of what is actually going on so defining and explaining terminology is extremely important next slide please so what do we want people to do in their disclosure for um, renewable hydrocarbons? Um, really want to see people address things as simple as the reporting issuer's interest, the type of interest they have, of course, the location, whether the project is standalone or it's part of a, a larger project or an existing facility, the substances that are um, going to be manufactured and their, their quantities. Next slide, please. The value of the project, if that's been determined, along with the basis for its determination, the methodology for determining it, the various input um, data and assumptions, the source of those, the effective date, the costs, the general timeline of the project, extremely important, the technology, the status of that technology is very important. Has the technology been used before? Is it piloted? Um, what, what are the risks and assumptions with that technology? I think very 
um, similar to what we see for oil and gas. Uh, when companies are talking about new technologies, there's an expectation that they're going to explain um, how that technology is going to be applied, where it's been used before, what the results have been, et cetera. Um, same thing should should be considered for um, when you're disclosing a renewable hydrogen, um, sorry, renewable hydrocarbon project, as well as uh, disclosing the significant factors or uncertainties and the risks. Next slide, please. Next subject we're going to talk about here, and the last one um, before we hand things over to Ramsey. We're going to talk about energy related environmental sustainability disclosure. So this type of disclosure is ubiquitous. We're seeing this um, all the time now. It's in sustainability reports. It's in continuous disclosure. It's in websites. It's um, in corporate presentations. Everybody's putting information out. Um, quality is varying. We're going to discuss energy related disclosure of this type from energy related reporting issuers. Next slide, please. So our concerns with this type of disclosure involve um, things like sustainability targets, absence of things like details, how those targets are going to be achieved, um, detailed timelines, etc. Project initiatives, or sorry, projects and initiatives. So there's an absence of things like, like timelines, costs, the status of the projects, etc. The technologies, they're often poorly described. There's no risk disclosure. Often they're novel. And, and, and we're talking about things like we're, we're seeing companies putting out disclosure around how they're going to be using carbon capture. They're going to be using some uh, variety of technology is going to be used in, in that respect. Uh, and they don't actually talk in any, provide any detailed information around what specifically they're going to be doing, um, what their interests in the technology may be, whether it's been tried before, where you know, where it's been tried, there's, there's a variety of things that you can imagine that, that a reader would, would uh, want to see. Um, support information is limited or absent, so they'll provide all this disclosure, make um, claims of what, what they're going to achieve, um, but there's very little information ultimately uh, in support of it. So the disclosure is often, uh, is just, it's often aspirational, sometimes overly promotional, and we know that overly promotional disclosure can be misleading. Um, next slide, please. So for this type of disclosure, we want to ensure it's in accordance, of course, with all applicable requirements. We've, we've gone through these for, for the last two um, subjects as well here. Material information is disclosed in regulatory filings. Key risks and assumptions are disclosed. Technical terminology is defined and explained. So we want to have all that covered. Uh, we're going to provide a couple of examples that don't meet expectations to try to get you to understand what exactly we're getting at here and what ultimately um, we want to try to avoid. So next slide, please. So example one, this is something that, that we've seen. I'm sure, you, I'm sure everybody has been, is aware of these types of um, uh, disclosure similar to this. Company saying something like, we'll produce the world's only zero emissions natural gas, or we're going to be the first to do this or something around sustainability. We're going to be the first net zero, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so in this type of a situation, um, okay, it's okay to say that, but there's there's a bunch of information that's going to be really incumbent on you to provide, because this this type of disclosure would appear to be material. I mean, that's that, for for most companies that would be um, a significant achievement. A it's definitely a material achievement. Um, and if you would put a sentence like that in your disclosure, say in a news release or a corporate presentation, and there's no support information around it, um, we would be or no information that sort of elaborates on what exactly you're talking about, we would be concerned. So deficiencies, if this was the only thing that you provided, the deficiencies would include things like how you intend to achieve this um, zero emissions natural gas, the timelines, the costs, the risks and assumptions, et cetera, the impact of this on the business. And of course, we're assuming that this company is a 51101 filer. So what is the impact of that on its on, on the company as a, as, as a 51101 filer? Um, are these considerations reflected in the evaluation? Um, what you're going to be doing, the costs associated with that, um, the timelines, et cetera, because we don't really know what you're going to be doing to achieve those zero emissions. So I would assume it would have some impact on uh, your 51101 disclosure. Now, the terminology, zero emissions, natural gas isn't explained. So some people might say, well, that, that's simple. It's the zero emissions. There's no emissions. But we see these terms being used in different ways by different issuers. 
um, oftentimes there'll be an asterisk and maybe an explanation about how they're using it, but sometimes there isn't that. And you have no idea how that term is being used. Um, and there may be an assumption that zero emissions actually means no emissions whatsoever uh, of any type, or it could just be emissions of a certain type, um, a certain greenhouse gas. So uh, also unsubstantiated comparison to other production. So companies saying they're gonna be the world's first um, or the world's only. Um, we see this fairly regularly. Uh, it's gotta be awfully difficult to, to um, for, for anybody to really fact check that. You know, sometimes it's, it, it's, it's very specific what a company is saying and, and we'll know that you know, nobody else is doing that. But oftentimes uh, when, when we're looking at disclosure, it'll be something that um, we're, we're pretty confident. There's lots of other companies that are um, trying to achieve the same thing. If you're gonna make a comment like that, you should expect um, feedback from us on it if you're not gonna provide support information. What, what have you done to ensure that, that you're gonna be the only one? Have you considered what other companies are doing? Um, or the fact that you're going to achieve it, but you're going to have a, lots of other companies are going to be achieving it around the same time. Um, to, so just making sure that you, you cover your back side on that uh, type of disclosure is very important. Next um, uh, scenario here, example. Um, so this one here, the, the company will reduce its carbon footprint through clean technologies like carbon capture, hydrogen, and cogeneration to be a carbon neutral midstream producer by 2030. All right, that sounds ambitious. So it does seem to be material. I would think that if you're going to achieve this, it's probably going to be material. And so for material disclosure, we're going to expect an awful lot of um, clar clarity around it. So some of the, the key deficiencies that we would point out here, there's an absence of information about um, specifics concerning implementation, the costs, the risks and assumptions, etc. And the impact of, of these achievements on, on the company's business, on its future revenues, etc. What's the, you know, when we have terminology here like carbon footprint and clean technologies and carbon neutral. Uh, those aren't explained. And, well, we're, at least in this case, we're assuming they're not explained. That's why there was a concern raised by us. But um, those terms, again, very similar to something like net zero or, or um, you know, clean tech and all these various terms that you, you hear people using all the time. Um, how are you using them in, in your particular situation? It's always advisable to provide an explanation and, and, and a definition of, if possible, of what, uh, what, what how, of what the, the term means to you and, and, and to, to give some context um, for how it's being used. So, um, you know, in this case, we, we assume that this company is, is midstream and not a 51101 filer, so we don't have uh, um, the concerns around the 51101 disclosure and it, the impact of these kind of declarations on that. But, but for a midstream issuer, what, what, how is this going to change how you conduct business? Um, very important consideration. So uh, those are the kind of things that we're, we're thinking as we're reading this type of information. So um, we are going to pause for some questions now, see if we have any on uh, the last three subjects that we just talked about. Um, okay, so the question here. Uh, whether or not pure play helium companies are subject to 51101. So no, they are not subject to 51101. So if you're a pure play helium company and you have, uh, you're not engaged in oil and gas activities and what you're doing is not associated with oil and gas activities, um, your disclosure would not be caught under 51101. So we would not want you to, um, you wouldn't be required to file um, or uh, provide your disclosure under 51101. And in fact, we would discourage you from doing that. Um, it could be misleading for you to, to, to do that, it could cause confusion. In fact, um, a lot of the, the people out there involved with helium don't wanna be associated with um, uh, oil and gas. So um, that, that may come up as a bit of a relief for some of them that they're, they're not required to file under 51101, but we would encourage you to use 51101 as a guideline for the types of information that you should be providing to um, stakeholders. Um, what is meant by elsewhere? So that's must, and is this a separate document filed on CDAR? So this must be in relation to when I say file uh, your information elsewhere. So it doesn't belong under 51101, file it elsewhere. That's a, that's a good question. So um, my, my thought on that would be uh, there's, there's lots of other regulatory documents, um, AIFs, MDNAs, where, they're in, where it may be more appropriate to talk about these things. Um, I would advise you to consult um, 
uh, get some uh, legal advice on that as to where it should be put. Um, if you're, if you're, you know, as, as you know, for annual filing requirements, um, if you're an AI, if you're um, uh, filing an AIF, and you include your oil and gas disclosure in there, um, it would make sense that you would also include some technical disclosure regarding this other subject matter um, within that AIF, um, unrelated to the uh, 51101 oil and gas disclosure. Um, so, hopefully, that covers it here. We'll. Uh, turn things over now to Ramsey Ewan, who is going to talk to you about sustainability disclosure, environmental sustainability emissions uh, specifically. Um, but uh, Ramsey, take it away. Thanks, Craig. So I'm happy to be here to share some of the things we've seen in terms of sustainability and environmental disclosures from our energy issuers over the past year and also some of the general trends we've been seeing in the last couple of years. I hope you'll find this informative and useful, but um, yeah, let's get started. So in recent years, there's been growing interest and demand from stakeholders for disclosure of greenhouse gas emissions, climate risks, and sustainability. And in the past few years, stakeholders have been showing their interest towards these types of disclosures and reporting issuers have been responding. Current Canadian securities legislation does not mandate GHG emissions disclosure. However, we have seen voluntary environmental and sustainability data disclosures from issuers as a response to the overall stakeholder interest in this area. So in, in anticipation of more prevalent GHG emissions disclosures, we've conducted sustainability technical screening reviews for energy related Alberta reporting issuers. Uh, this would include uh, those engaged in oil and gas activities, oil and gas midstream issuers, and oil and gas services issuers. The data collected through these reviews are ongoing, and we do plan to continue to collect these information on sustainability disclosures. These screening reviews assess basic information, such as whether or not sustainability disclosure has occurred, the timing and frequency of disclosure, how the disclosure has been prepared, the method of disclosure, and whether or not specific environmental information has been disclosed. However, these reviews didn't assess the quality of the disclosure, nor whether or not specific social or governance type information has been disclosed. Next slide, please. Uh, GHG emissions disclosure is currently being done by reporting issuers through voluntary disclosure, such as through sustainability reports or through disclosures made on their company websites. So of the reporting issuers engaged in oil and gas activities for which the ASC is the principal regulator, 62 issuers or 54% have had recent sustainability disclosures and 53, dis 53 issuers um, had no recent sustainability disclosure. And 42% of issuers have provided this information in a standalone sustainability report. 12% of oil and gas issuers only have the information in the section on their website. But it's important to note here that the information disclosed on websites, we found to be usually less informative than those disclosed in standalone reports. And rarely do these have any quantified metrics such as GHG emissions. So in comparison to last year, there were 33% of issuers engaged in oil and gas um, who published a standalone sustainability report. So there has been a pretty sizable increase in the number of issuers who publish sustainability data year over year. Also interesting to note, uh, there's been approximately four oil and gas issuers we've identified where 2022 was the first publication year of their sustainability report. So new to this year's edition of the Energy Matters Report, we've extended the sustainability technical screening review data to include oil and gas midstream and pipelines and oil and gas services reporting issuers. Um, so I should mention now that our sampling size for the previous figure and this figure is 115 oil and gas issuers, 10 midstream, and 30 oil and gas services issuers. So you can see that 
All of the oil and gas midstream and pipeline Alberta reporting issuers have had a recent sustainability report published. And 33% of oil and gas services Alberta reporting issuers had a sustainability report published. And 10% made that disclosure through a standalone sustainability report. Next slide, please. So the oil and gas reporting issuers were then grouped by annual production with senior reporting issuers being those with greater than 100,000 BOE per day of production, intermediates being between 10,000 and 100,000 BOE per day, and juniors being those with under 10,000 BOE per day of production. And then they were ranked by highest production and selected from each group. So ultimately we sampled nine senior, 20 intermediate and 50 junior representative reporting issuers for these uh, next few figures. Um, so as shown in the figure, all of the representative senior issuers have published a standalone report containing sustainability information. And 19 out of 20 intermediate issuers have published a standalone sustainability report. And of the junior oil and gas issuers, seven reporting issuers have a standalone in sustainability report. 11 have some sustainability information on their website and 32 junior oil and gas issuers currently have no su substantial su sustainability disclosure. So compared to last year, there's generally no broad changes in the term in terms of the senior and intermediate oil and gas issuers. However, there was an increase in the number of junior oil and gas issuers with a sustainability report. Uh, last year, there were three that we identified with a standalone sustainability report. So the, these next two slides will be showing the sustainability reporting frameworks and standards being used by the issuers uh, in their sustainability reports. Uh, uh, important note here, these figures relate only to those that have published a sus standalone sustainability report. And just to go through the, the basic frameworks and standards, um, they are the Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosure or TCFD, um, the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, or the SASB standards, or and the uh, Global Reporting Initiative, or GRE standards. And we we've chosen to focus on three, these three because they are currently the most common frameworks and standards being used to prepare the disclosure of sustainability information. And combined with last year's review, it provides a continuity of information year over year. Uh, so from the numbers shown in the figure, it's clear that many of the reporting issuers are actually using more than one framework to prepare their disclosure. So we have seven senior reporting issuers and 11 intermediate reporting issuers that are incorporating all three frameworks and standards in their sustainability disclosures. Compared to last year, there's little change in the overall trend or big picture of how these frameworks and standards are being used. Um, so in the next slide, uh, in this figure, we see the frameworks and standards being used by each of the oil and gas sub industries compared to the oil and gas uh, industry. Uh, so here we see that the that there's a similar proportion of oil and gas services and oil and gas midstream that are using all three frameworks, which I think is the key takeaway in um, these two slides here, is that these reporting schemes, while they are each unique, they are also complementary to each other. So this next figure shows the GHG emissions disclosure among the reporting issuers by production grouping. Scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions have been disclosed in terms of CO2 equivalents, which includes the emissions of carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide. So these scopes are generally defined, um, but broadly they refer to scope one being all direct emissions owned or controlled by the reporting issuer, and scope two referring to indirect emissions attributed to energy acquired by the reporting issuer. Generally, this means purchased electricity, heat, or steam, and scope three refers to all other indirect emissions attributed to the value chain of the reporting issuer. Um, other air emissions on this figure includes nitrogen oxides, sulfur dioxide, volatile organic compounds, and particulate matter emissions. 
Uh, these are generally disclosed separately by the issuer, but they've been grouped here in this figure. So as shown, all of the senior issuers and 95% of the intermediates um, disclose scope one emissions, 12% of the junior scope disclose scope one emissions. Uh, so scope three emissions here are less widely disclosed, however, and when they are disclosed, there are a number of differences in the disclosure in terms of what the scope three number actually includes. Uh, so for example, some scope three uh, emissions disclosures will only include the emissions associated with the end use of products um, associated with their upstream division, or let's say only the emissions counted by their employees commutes and business travel, uh, that, that kind of thing. Uh, in general, there's been little year-over-year -year changes in this figure compared to last year, with the exception that there's a few more issuers adding Scope 3 emissions disclosure to their sustainability reports. So this figure shows the emissions disclosure of oil and gas compared to the other sub-industries, oil and gas services, and oil and gas midstream. So as a reminder, the sample size for these figures are 79 oil and gas issuers, 10 midstream and 30 oil and gas services issuers. So all oil and gas midstream issuers have disclosed scope one emissions and to a lesser extent, uh, scope three emissions. And there are proportionally fewer oil and gas services companies that have GHG emissions disclosure. Next slide. So this final figure shows a few of the other key environmental disclosures by production grouping. So energy usage, water usage, and abandonment and reclamation activities are some of the commonly observed oil and gas um, uh, sustainability metrics we've seen uh, being disclosed in the reports. So of these, abandonment and reclamation activities may be of particular interest due to related disclosure requirements in NI51-101. Uh, so the majority of senior and intermediate oil and gas issuers have provided this information in their sustainability reports. And um, I think that's that's all I have for the sustainability disclosure review portion of this presentation. I will uh, hand it back to Craig to discuss energy and the Alberta capital markets. Thanks, Ramsey. Um, next, we're gonna talk about energy and the Alberta capital market. This will just take a couple of minutes and then we're gonna get to a wrap up Q and A. So um, next, uh, there we go. So uh, first, we'll, we'll give a brief introduction here. Uh, so capital market intelligence uh, is critical for us. Uh, we can't really regulate it effectively if we don't understand our capital market. Um, so we gather lots of information um, and, and analyze it. And, and this is, uh, includes stuff from um, disclosure from reporting issuers that are principally regulated by the ASC as well as um, a lot of issuers that are not, they're regulated by other jurisdictions. Um, we also look to market data, uh, Canadian market data and, and market data from other international capital markets. So um, this, this sort of includes you know, the, the information that Ramsey was just talking about um, in order for us to be able to talk about or you know, sort of give, a, give um, a bit of an update on, on what sustainability disclosure looks like year to year. We need to collect information, we need to study it. So we do that. Um, through everything that we do, we're, we're always looking to better understand our capital market. Uh, what information are we going to need to help us better understand it? How do we effectively, efficiently collect it? And what kind of analysis do we need to do? So we're going to talk about some of our data and analysis here in the next uh, few slides. Uh, but um, just if you want to see more about Alberta capital markets um, and our views on it, um, please see our 2022 Energy Matters report. We've got a pretty robust section at the end uh, that goes into an awful lot more detail than we could possibly do today. Uh, and this, this the um, uh, charts we're going to look at here uh, is just really a sampling. So um, uh, next slide, please. So as we go through these, just want to emphasize all these charts that we're going to talk about are the information that you're seeing is for um, uh, issuers that are principally regulated by the ASC. So we're not talking, we're not include, incorporating or, um, uh, or relating this in any way to issuers outside of, um, um, outside of that. So from any other jurisdiction in Canada, they're not included. So this, um, 
gives you a little bit of a checkup on the status of reporting issuers by energy sub industry from 2021 to 2022 year to date. So this was um, at the end of September. So keep in mind here that these numbers um, will have changed uh, probably slightly. Uh, but what we really continue to see on the oil and gas side is, is, is further consolidation in the numbers of reporting issuers from the 51101 filers on the far left um, through midstream and services. We, we have seen a, a few new entrants uh, to, I guess, replace to some extent some of the issuers that have uh, disappeared. So that was has, has been interesting to see. Um, so uh, also, uh, you know, I think maybe a little bit of a bright light here is with, with the category other. So we have seen some other energy issuers um, enter the space. So the, the, the 19 companies, these um, uh, are, a lot of these are relatively small new issuers. Uh, we've got uh, lots of uh, ex hopes and expectations for their futures. Um, so we want to want to see that column uh, growing uh, ho hopefully next year when we uh, when we do this again. Next slide, please. Uh, so with respect to the oil and gas, uh, so the, the reporting issues that are engaged in oil and gas activities. So this this chart is something that we, we include in our report every single year. And uh, so you you can see here that the, the, the um, decrease in, in number of reporting issuers has continued, uh, but we've seen a bit of a moderation here um, in the last couple of years. And, and in fact, uh, you know, we have seen a couple of new entrants. So I'm hoping that we're going to see that number stabilize. If not, um, maybe uh, maybe grow. Um, got my fingers crossed here. So um, let's uh, let's go to the next slide. So this chart here. Uh, profiles the market capitalization by energy sub industry. So the ones that we just talked about in the first slide, all those issuers, um, market caps in this chart, just to give a bit of a relative perspective, um, not trying to be uh, um, overly negative here, but um, you can you can see or positive, I guess, depending on, on, on your, your perspective here, but you can see the the um, relative uh, market capitalization for the oil and gas, uh, the 51101 filers, the midstream, and, and the uh, services uh, compared to all other energy sub industries um, for um, comprise of um, um, Alberta uh, prime regulated issuers. So uh, it, they, they dominate the market caps, and um, we did see a little bit of a modest improvement year over year. You'll see, though, on the far right, that under for the other um, the market caps for those 19 or 15 last year 19 this year the, the very small uh, comparatively speaking uh, market caps so two billion um, each of the last two years uh, for those so hoping we're going to see those um, uh, improve in in in, in future years uh, next slide please so. We're going to talk here uh, next about capital raised by prospectus by reporting issuers engaged in oil and gas activities by type, so securities type, be it debt, equity, or both. We've also got on here the number of offerings, and this goes back to 2016. Um, so, of course, we had some, we had a couple of good years there in 2016, 2017, comparatively speaking, and um, it, there has been a significant drop off since. And 2021 was. Uh, significantly better than 2022 and uh, so year to date um, in 2022 up to the end of September and the offerings that we saw were were equity um, didn't see any debt and uh, there was not not just a, a drop off in the amount raised but also the number of offerings next slide please so this slide is the capital raised in the exempt market so issuers that are raising capital without a prospectus by reporting issuers engaged in oil and gas activities. So this is for our 51101 filers that are principally regulated in Alberta that we talk about. Um, our 115 reporting issuers, if they raise capital in the exempt market relative to public markets um, via prospectus, um, it is represented on this chart. So we have seen um, as well a decrease in the amount and the number of offerings um, in recent years and uh, year over year was uh, a significant uh, decrease as well here from 2021 to 2022 in the amounts and also the uh, number of offerings. Next slide, please. So this is the capital raised by reporting issuers engaged in oil and gas activities uh, 
comparison between the capital raised by prospectus and, and capital raised in the exempt market. Um, so you'll see here that uh, it, it, it varies year to year, whether there's more capital raised in the public market versus the exempt market. Uh, for 2022, we saw more raised in the exempt market than the public market, and also uh, more offerings in the exempt market relative to the um, public market, So, um, which is interesting. Next slide, please. So this slide is the represents the capital raised by prospectus by reporting issuers in oil and gas services and oil and gas midstream. And uh, it's almost uh, unfortunately non-existent the amount of capital raised in 2022 uh, for um, services, a little tiny bit for, for midstream, but um, sort of consistent with what we saw for capital raising across all of our energy sub industries. It was uh, 2022 was a um, significantly down year. Next slide, please. So this is our last slide, and uh, this is, represents capital raised by prospectus by reporting issuers and other energy, energy sub-industries. So this includes um, helium, utilities, and other that we've talked about previously, as well as the number of offerings. It's got the amount raised, and clearly 2022, not, uh, not a lot. And uh, so it was definitely an off year uh, as well consistent with the other energy sub-industries. So that is what I have uh, for you. So I think what we'll do next, we are going to move to our question, our sort of our wrap up questions. And I think maybe what we'll do is, um, we'll see if we've got some questions uh, on maybe the sustainability. Have we got anything on the sustainability that Ramsey, you would like to address? Yeah, I think I see a few questions here I can start addressing. Um, so first one, for the reporting issuers that report scope three, do you have an idea of how long they've been reporting scope three GHG emissions? Yeah, uh, thank you for the question. So scope three emissions is something that does get brought up a lot. And it's somewhat of a hot topic lately when it comes to GHG emissions disclosure. Uh, we have seen scope three GHG emissions disclosure being done by some of the senior issuers, but even among them, I think it appears to be fairly new, uh, a fairly new disclosure metric. So um, I'd say that of the issuers that have disclosed scope three emissions, I think most have only been doing so for um, one or one or three years. Um, got another one. Uh, so only certain categories of scope three are being reported by uh, some issuers. Um, are there issuers who have not disclosed their entire scope one or two emissions? Uh, yeah, that's a very good question and good point. Um, in, in general, no. Um, so for scope three, what we're seeing from the disclosure is that issuers are saying that it's generally difficult to estimate an entire scope three number for the entire value chain uh, due to lack of reliable data. Since all this uh, emissions data disclosure is a fairly new thing, so your scope three will be someone else's scope one, scope two, that kind of thing. But in general, um, what I've found from the issuers who've uh, voluntarily disclosed scope one and two emissions is that it does appear to be a fairly complete scope one or two. And I think part of the reasoning may be that scope one and two emissions are just going to be easier than scope three emissions to quantify or estimate to, to any degree of confidence. Um, do you have another couple sustainability questions? So I'll just uh, keep going, I guess. Um, are you aware of if the emissions disclosures are being audited by a third party? Uh, yeah, short answer is yes, we have seen it. Um, even with voluntary disclosures, uh, some of the issuers I've seen uh, will have their GHG emissions um, audited by a third party. Uh, I don't have any specific numbers with me right now, but notionally, it, it is um, less than half of the issuers we've sampled with scope one disclosures that currently also have them audited by a third party. Um, I think it's generally going to be limit, a limited assurance level of audit. Um, 
But we have also seen some reasonable assurances on scope one and scope two emissions. Ramsey, do you want to give an update on on the proposed fifty one one zero seven? Is that something? yeah? Um, yeah, there was a there, there was a question that came up on that. I can take a crack on that one, and uh, if you have anything to add, um, feel free. Um, yeah, so just for those who are not aware, the CSA published a proposed climate related um, disclosure instrument. 51107 uh, in October of 2021. So currently the comment letters are being revisited and they're being reconsidered in conjunction with kind of the recent uh, international developments, uh, namely the uh, SEC and the ISSB proposals on sustainability disclosures. So I think that's where it is right now. The uh, comment letters are being reconsidered um, and yeah. I think that I think that um, is 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 good. I, you know, just stay tuned. I guess is the is the message. Um, Ramsey, I've just got I've got one question here. Maybe I'll address this. So, uh, regarding the charts that I went through, the capital markets charts, um, the question was how they reflect the oil and gas industry. Uh, for example, is it an industry wide summary? So, those charts represent. Um, and there's a little bit of a difference between what is in the report itself and what is uh, was discussed here today. If you go to the report, you'll see um, detailed explanations as to what each chart represents, um, whether it's uh, Alberta reporting, uh, Alberta reporting issues principally regulated by the ASC um, or other jurisdictions. Um, we do have a little bit of a mix there, but for the charts that we talked about here today, those are um, Alberta principally regulated issuers, and um, it, it is it, those are the only ones that are included there. And so, uh, and it is capital raised by prospectus for the most part, or um, in the exempt market, but is still uh, just those. Um, we, we haven't touched on uh, in any of those slides exempt market capital raising by non um, 51101 filers. So hopefully that helps there. Ramsey, do you have any, it doesn't look like, it doesn't look like I see any other questions here. It looks like maybe we've. Yeah, I don't, I don't think I see any on my end either. Okay. All right. Well, I guess then um, we have got off comparatively easy with the questions. So what uh, I would suggest is that um, if anybody here has any questions, comments, concerns, wants to follow up, um, very happy to uh, engage with you. Please um, consult the contact information here that you see on the screen. We are very happy to, um, to, uh, to address anything we can. We have got a general um, Dropbox for uh, energy inquiries. We also have a um, oil and gas 51101. Um, uh, email uh, that you can reach out to us on. Either of those is okay. And um, thank you so much for your your attention today. Uh, really, uh, really appreciate and uh, hope to see you soon. Thank you very much. And uh, have yourselves a great day.